Okay, so thank you. Welcome again. We can start uh, our first event of this uh, Youth for Mountain series. Uh, you are welcome. Before starting, just some instruction. Uh, please remind to mute your microphone. If you want, you can turn your camera on so to see um, other people. Uh, as already said, uh, during the event, we will use Miro. It is this dashboard in which you can enter and you can write down your comments, your ideas. There is also, there is also a space in which you can write questions for uh, our experts, uh, our keynote speaker. And for any kind of technical issue, you can write down in, the, in this Zoom chat. Uh, and so our team will respond to you immediately. Um, we are part of a team, the Unimon team, the University of Mountain. It is part of the University of Milan. Uh, there is Giacomo, Stefano, Sara, and Tiziana that are also in this, uh, in this meeting now. So feel free to contact us for any kind of question, of ideas, or insight, or any ideas that you want to share with us. Um, whoop. Sorry. Um, before I start, just remind what is this Youth Pro Mountain series. Uh, this program is a program for young people and is an open consultation to create the Mountain Education and Innovation Manifesto for the promotion of a sustainable and lively future in mountains area, which will be presented during the Expo 2020 Dubai. We will talk about climate change, biodiversity, interconnections and mobility, virtual and physical, and mountain entrepreneurship and innovation. So we will talk about a, a lot of things that uh, are related to mountains community, to mountains areas. And uh, uh, this program was developed with a lot of different partners, partners uh, as you know, mountain partnership from FAO, Euro Montana, Hal Park, Youth, uh, Youth Council of Herosalp, and AVK2 Minoprio. Uh, before introducing the speaker, I would like also to present you because you uh, answered to our question for, uh, for the participation to this uh, program. And we know that there are a lot of uh, women, a lot of girls that are attending now this uh, program. There are a lot of students. Uh, I think that uh, there is a well balance uh, between students and workers' participation. So it's, um, it's very good for, for this. And uh, we will come from a lot of different countries. We are really excited about that because where, um, there are a lot of particip participants from Europe, uh, but also from India, from Pakistan, from Asia overall, as well as from Africa, from South America, and someone also from uh, North America and Central America. So we are really happy, and uh, we think that we can create really a great worldwide community to speak, uh, that will speak about mountains area and mountains needs. Uh, what this, what do you say does also? Uh, a lot of you uh, live in mountain areas, so you can you can bring us also your personal experience of people that uh, live in mountain areas, so really well know the needs of mountain areas. And there are also other people that uh, spend time in mountain areas because of working activity. So we can mix personal and professional expertise and knowledge. Uh, what did you say, Daza, is also that uh, you are looking forward to bringing to this serious technical expertise. So we have, uh, we could have also increased um, expertise uh, for what concerns environmental and social um, and social aspects of sustainable development. Uh, uh, in mountains, uh, and do you have a personal experience to share with others? What do you want? What are the aspects that is most excited you about following this map for serious? 
uh, most of all say to us that uh, they want to find new solutions. So we will try to reach the, this goal. Uh, during this first event, we will uh, have also a super expert that can help us in order to identify some solution for real problem. And uh, yes, we have to remind that uh, this is uh, uh, our goal, find new solution for real problem, then um, increase awareness on this topic and share ideas because as we can see, there are a lot of people that are passionate about sustainability topics overall. Uh, and finally, uh, what are the um, topics that are you most interested in? Climate change, we know that uh, is a trend topic now, but for you is important also biodiversity and then mountain entrepreneurship and innovation, and at least interconnection and virtual and physical mobility. But I think that after the uh, presentation of um, the professor Maria Mar Delgado, someone will change, his, uh, will change our idea um, because uh, she will uh, introduce us some projects, in really interesting projects about interconnection and analysis of uh, uh, mountain value chain from that perspective. Okay, so uh, get involved. I remind you to use Miro, so hand, uh, feel free to comment and share your uh, first opinion and ideas. And uh, now we will have a, a briefly overview of our speaker. Uh, and then at least I will introduce Maurizio Gallo. Uh, but first, um, uh, an overview of, this, of our speakers for today's um, session. Rosa Laura Romeo will speak uh, uh, about local and uh, how local entrepreneurship brings value to mountain communities. And she will show us international case study, really interesting. She's program officer at Mountain Partnership Secretariat. Uh, then uh, also we will have uh, Julian Fisher, thank you. Director of Zero Water Day Partnership. I will introduce uh, all of them also later. Uh, Maria Mal Delgado from the University of Cordoba. And uh, Valeria Leoni, that um, uh, he's a research fellow on the University of Milan. He will talk about universe, uh, um, biodiversity and agrobiodiversity. Um, at last but not at least, Maurizio Gatti. Hello. We can't hear you anymore, Nari. I think we have a connection problem, but anyway. Uh, um, okay, she's back. He led also expedition for uh, cleaning glaciers from waste and preserve mountains environment. For us, he collected the amazing pictures of uh, his expeditions. So we are really honored to have him at the stage of uh, Youth for Mountain Series. Please, uh, Maurizio, the stage is yours and we will uh, share with uh, all the participants this, this picture. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, good morning or good evening, depends where you are uh, to everyone. Uh, I've seen that uh, some of you are uh, living in the mountains and some one of you are in Pakistan also. And so my speech uh, regards the mountains, especially of Pakistan. Um, uh, just uh, to share with you more, uh, more information about uh, my, my career or my experience. I, I am an engineer um, in uh, the University of Padova a lot of years ago. I started working at the university for a few years and then uh, I prefer my to go behind my passion. Uh, I am uh, so the, I became a mountain guide, an international mountain guide. I spent uh, almost uh, all my life, I can say, in the mountains uh, of the world. Um, especially for the high mountains, um, I 
work uh, un until 1990 in the, the organization created by Ardito Desio, that is uh, the leader of the expedition of Italian climbers that climbed for the first time uh, K2 mountains in, uh, in Karakorum. And with the, this organization, now you can say, you can see in the, in the sh um, some, inform some uh, different sh um, pictures on the screen, uh, but uh, later I can explain something of this. We, they go ahead uh, uh, like, uh, like they have. They have. <laughs> okay, so I start uh, working in the high mountains, Everest. Um, and my organization name is Everest. K2, so it connected the two highest mountains of the world. Why? Because uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, there are some people that uh, want to know if uh, Everest is uh, really higher than K2. And so Ardito Desio organized uh, two expeditions, one on uh, Mount Everest and the other on K2 to, to calculate the, the exact altitude of the mountains. And this is uh, for me the first time that I visit these areas. And uh, from that time, I, I can say I never, I never stopped uh, going there and uh, living with the people of this part of the world. On Mount Everest, uh, we established uh, on 1990 uh, a lab, an high altitude lab. It's uh, a glass pyramid that is near the base camp of Mount Everest, 5,000 meter height, in which uh, we start uh, studying the human attitude uh, with the acclimatization, uh, acclimatization to the high altitudes. I was uh, a subject for the studies. Uh, so they sent me to cycle to on my on a small uh, bicycle, uh, 8,000 meter feet uh, on the south call of Mount Everest. It was very hard uh, these years. But uh, after this experience, the pyramid start working mostly on the, the meteorological uh, issue. We established a big uh, weather station up there. And we have uh, for some years also a weather station at 8,000 meter high in uh, Mount Everest uh, region. And uh, especially the, we are studying the pollution, not only the temperature and these things, but also the air pollution around the high mountains because uh, you know there is a, some there is a big uh, brown cloud uh, we can say asian brown cloud that is arriving from india and china and is going through I, um, himalayas now and is moving to to west so the studies are concerning especially how this uh, pollution cloud is uh, moving and how intense is the pollution in the mountain higher mountains but uh, I want to talk uh, to you all today about uh, my experience in Karakorum. Karakorum and the Himalayans are uh, quite different, and uh, especially um, concerning the, the precipitations and uh, the temperature. You know, the, for example, just to give you an example, uh, in the last years, uh, the climbers are trying to summit uh, the 8,000 meter in winter. It was very easy on Mount Everest, but is uh, only last year, uh, they, they, there is a successful expedition on Mount K2. Just to tell you how, how much difficult is K2, but especially how much snow you can find on this area and how colder temperature are there on K2, in Karakorum compared to Himalayas. Okay, um, so uh, it is uh, 20 years of work in Karakorum, uh, climbing and uh, studying. Uh, we arrived a few years ago to establish and uh, finalize the management plan of the Central Karakorum National Park. That is uh, 10 uh, big, very big national park. It is 10, thousand square kilometers park and I can say is the highest park in the world because inside the park there are four uh, for uh, 800 8,100 meter peaks uh, k2 in the first and then the other three and um, a part of these four there are uh, around uh, around 1,000 peaks uh, or around 7,000 meters so I can say that is really one of the highest 
part of the world. Uh, we, we, the point is that uh, in the studies that uh, our uh, researcher uh, conduct in the area, uh, they, uh, we are lucky because the Italians start uh, organize expedition on Karakoro in early, early 90, um, I guess 80, 90, 1890. So we have pictures of that period and we can compare the pictures of uh, the first uh, years of the, this um, period with the actual ones. So what, what we can say about Karakorum glaciers is that it's strange to say that uh, the glaciers in Karakorum are not uh, retreating, but uh, still they are uh, almost in the same uh, dimension and length compared to the, the one, 100 years ago. Uh, why? Why uh, the, the studies uh, can, uh, can explain uh, this uh, strange anomaly uh, with the, the high level of precipitations in high mountains around uh, the Karakorum. So have you, I told you there are really very high mountains around the, the park, around the Karakorum glaciers. And that this means that uh, the quantity of snow arriving in the higher uh, level is also much more than the, than the past. All this snow became uh, in glacier in the time. And so the length of the glacier remained the same. Um, this is uh, a good, uh, good opportunity for all the people living around uh, this area because uh, the Karakorum uh, glaciers are the third the big uh, pole of glacier of the world, uh, uh, the biggest part of the poles areas. So it, uh, the, the water that is coming out from this uh, glacier, glacier area is uh, giving water and uh, opportunities to survive to, I can say, um, billions of people around the Middle Asia. So it's uh, very important that uh, this uh, this uh, Karakorum anomaly remain, uh, remain true also for the next years. This year we are starting a new project that uh, the name is Glaciers and Students that uh, will, uh, the, the main uh, goals of this project will be the, all the catastrophe, all the glaciers that are in Karakorum. It means 5,000 glaciers. We want to make uh, a, a map of all these glaciers with the new satellite images, very detailed. Uh, so this will be became a, a will become a, a baseline for the next studies for the future. So to create a, a actual baseline is, I think, is important to understand what happened in the future with the climate change issues. Uh, what I can say the. The situation of the glacier of Karakorum is a specific area due to altitude, but around Pakistan, there are other glaciers, the lower altitude ones that are losing their length and that they are retreating a lot. So the situation has to be monitored for the next years. And we start this project that for me is very important because it's not only a scientist work, but uh, students. Students are involved. We are uh, organizing some seminars in the University of Gilbaltistan, the region in which uh, the, this park is inside. And uh, we are preparing an app uh, to give to the students. They can use uh, their smartphones and uh, move around with us, uh, with our professor, with our scientists around the area, around the glacier, and take themselves information about the glacier. And so it will be a, a something that they can continue. Students and the young generation, I think, uh, is uh, the main, uh, the main uh, and important uh, people that can really change the world. We, are, we, are, we were not able to do this, and uh, I hope the new generation can do these, uh, these uh, changing for the user. What I can say again, uh, two more points that for me are very important because uh, if the glacier, the Karakorum glacier remain the same for the moment, uh, mm, the situation is completely different uh, in the villages that uh, are surrounding the glacier area. 
around uh, the Karakorum National Park, there are uh, 200 villages that are located uh, at almost 250, 2,500 to 3,000 meter high. So they live in very high altitude. And for them, the conditions are different compared to the past. Um, just to tell you, it's really strange that the people that live in these villages uh, use uh, to, in the past to pass their winter under the ground. They roam are in two levels, one over the ground for the summer and one under the ground in a cave completely without windows in which they live uh, in the past uh, three, four months uh, completely close with the animals, that the animals create um, warmth for them. Uh, this uh, beautiful casa, because they are really very beautiful, now are going to be destroyed because the temperature in the villages are increasing, so they don't need anymore to live under the ground. And they are building new houses, common houses over the ground. The snow in these villages is less than the past, and also the temper winter temperature are uh, more uh, warm than the past. It means that uh, their life is completely different. They don't have uh, enough water uh, to survive dur during the spring and summer season. And they, they, they provide the water with the long water channels that start from the higher point in the glacier. But uh, now they have to est establish new channels for one or two kilometers more long longer than before, so a big work, expensive work. And for them, uh, without the water coming from uh, these channels, it's impossible to survive. The agriculture is finished, the life is finished. They live with uh, cows, goats, uh, and some products of the fields. Also the season uh, for them in which they can uh, start working in the fields is uh, now different. They can start working earlier in the in spring because there is no, no snow over the ground at, at 3000 meters. And uh, the, the, then the, in the summer, the temperatures grows a lot. And so for them it's very difficult to, to work uh, with a new situation of uh, temperature. Uh, they have to adapt their life to the new climate change situation. They try to find a new seeds, new timing for the cultivations. But uh, for them, uh, they cannot do anything for mitigation. They are uh, living there, uh, in small villages a bit near the mountain, the high mountain. They can only adapt their life to the new situation. It is for them very, very difficult. Um, another uh, final uh, question, things that I want to share with you, especially because if you are going to the mountains is very important, is the question of pollution. Um, the, we, in the last uh, 15 years, uh, organized several um, cleaning campaign on these glaciers. In 10 years, we collect more than 80,000 waste from the glaciers. And uh, 80,000 waste is a big amount. We have installed, um, installed an incinerator, special incinerator that can burn uh, ground, big, big part of this, uh, of this waste. But uh, the problem remain very, very huge. I spent a lot of time to train the local uh, high altitude porters, the local cooks, uh, the local uh, people the local guides, but still we are not able to find a, a light uh, behind the tunnel. So every year, the expedition teams, the trekking teams leave on the glacier a lot of waste. And every year we have to start again to clean the glaciers. Uh, it's not uh, really you know, a very good situation. Uh, this has to be changed plastic has to be avoided completely from the glaciers. In uh, Nepal, Mount Everest, they, they cancel completely the plastic bottles, but in Karakorum uh, is still not uh, working this way. A lot of plastic remain on the glaciers and a lot, uh, especially also uh, human waste. You can 
you can understand because for each for each member of expedition there are 10 porters so it means that they remain on the glacier for months and all these people i think thousands of people use the glacier also for their human waste and these things have to be taken away from the glacier otherwise the water will be completely polluted and it is a big issue because the people that are in the expedition are drinking from the glacier the water for the expedition but also the people living under the glacier in the valleys and down in uh, the Indus River is coming out from these glaciers. Uh, so until Karachi and uh, the, the lower part of Pakistan and India, they are using the same water that is really polluted. So uh, please, uh, if you are going in the mountains, uh, take away everything with you. Don't leave anything. And uh, another, especially if you are going to the high mountains, your mind is completely dedicated to uh, your mission in the mountains and you forget to 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 look uh, what is happening behind you you uh, you arrive in the tent and some cooks are preparing you the the food uh, so you eat uh, you think only i have to prepare my expedition i have to be acclimatized i have to drink a lot of water but uh, you don't care what uh, the cook is doing with the, uh, all of the things that he is cooking in the kitchen. So please go there and uh, teach them that they don't have to leave anything around. So not only to take away your waste, but look around you and uh, look also what the other people are doing. For the National Park, we have introduced uh, a fee, a high fee of $100 for each member of the expeditions. And uh, this fee is going to the park management uh, that is using the fees to clean the waste from the glaciers. So $100 is a lot amount, a big amount, but I think is necessary probably to improve a little bit more because of the, 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 this amount is not enough to make the cleaning activities in the glaciers. You remember the glacier of Baltoro are 40 kilometers long. So to take the waste from the glacier means that you have to, to use the porters and the porters uh, rate uh, is for 10, 10 days is very is high, not very high, but it's in any case a big cost. So to take clean these glaciers is very expensive and it's very difficult for the park management uh, to, to go ahead in this activity. So it's important that everyone uh, be careful and leave the mountains as they are before. Sorry. So it is, that's all. And take care and be be in the mountains in the right way. Thank you, thank you, Maurizio. Really, thank you for sharing with us uh, your experience, and thank you for what you do for a mountain. So uh, it's really a pleasure for us to. Uh, to listen to your speech and maybe um, Stefano, uh, probably there are some questions for um, Maurizio or maybe we can uh, move to the other uh, um, to the other speaker because I Maurizio are with us. Okay, perfect. Yes. There is a question for you probably, uh, Stefano. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, there is. Um, there are a few questions, but I would uh, underline this one, uh, which asks if you involve uh, young people or youth in your research activities and what could be the added value if you haven't involved them, but maybe plan to do it in the future. As I told you, yes, um, we want to involve the young people, especially from the University of uh, Gilgit Baltistan. And because, uh, yes, uh, the young people is, uh, I, I told you before, the only solution for this, for me, uh, for the problem that uh, they have to face in the mountains. They live there. So the people, we already organized uh, several workshops uh, at university. In the Gilgit University, they are establishing a water lab for studying the water uh, pollution uh, around uh, the glaciers and around the villages. We have now established a glaciologist uh, lab to study the glacier. And in this lab, uh, the young 
people of the university are working and that they work uh, more for the future, for sure. Mm. In uh, my training also with the young uh, guides of uh, group, tracking groups, uh, young cooks uh, in, no, you know, in the mountains uh, in Pakistan, uh, there are mostly uh, employed uh, young people. So it's very important to, to, to teach them how to change their use about the waste because uh, Pakistan is not, I can say, is not a, a clean place. Uh, they, they use uh, to put uh, waste everywhere in the towns, in the villages, it's almost uh, as other parts in the world, is almost everywhere a big issue of waste. So starting from the young generation, we had to change completely also the habit, uh, the normal use in Pakistan, in this country in which uh, the waste uh, Management is very difficult, for sure. Uh, I, I am. Other climbers, other old people like me, thinks that uh, uh, everything is finished. The world is now is not possible to save the world. And I, my, my, I hope that uh, the young generation really can change the world, and we have to work especially with the young people. Okay, thank you really Maurizio for being here with this section. Uh, keep us updated about your project that they are amazing. So we will keep in touch and thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move to the other speaker for today that is Julian Fischer. Uh, just some words to introduce him. He is director of Zero Water Day Partnership. He is a policy analyst with expertise in lifelong learning, social and environmental determinants of health and health in all policy approaches. His work experience includes international public health policy and advocacy, for example, consultancy for UN agency, including WHO, UNESCO, and UNEP. Uh, his work um, and the projects cover many geographical locations, including Europe, Africa, Saudi Arabia, Falkland, Islands, and Antarctica. So we are really pleasure to uh, listen to uh, her uh, to the speech. Uh, thank you, Julian. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And Maurizio, uh, a very nice presentation, and um, I'll pick up on some of the things that you were you were mentioning there. Um, just a quick ch uh, check, Stefano. You can see my picture. Good. Is good? Excellent. Yes. Yes. Very nice. So um, mountains as water towers of the world. Um, Going to really tell you uh, about the the project we have and the initiatives that we have. Um, that's really looking at water uh, and the mountains. Um, so this really started. I worked in South Africa, and the Zero Water Day comes from the time in South Africa, particularly in Cape Town, when they almost ran out of water. So that's where the idea of the Zero Water Day initiative came from. And after that, I started a, a partnership of uh, schools or 13 schools in 13 different countries around the world who all decided, you know what, exactly as Maurizio and others were saying, we want to do something. And we want to do something in our homes, in our schools, in our communities around water. Um, and when I've been teaching in the schools, they all say, we want to save the planet. Exactly as Maurizio was saying, youth and children, we want to do something. And one of the um, challenges has been trying to explain or find a, a way of explaining climate change and all its complexity to children. And mountains are a fantastic opportunity. So um, as, as Maurizio mentioned at the very end there, a lot of guides, perhaps as you mentioned, uh, the people in the older generations say, you know, that's it, we've wrecked the planet. And younger generations want to move from that picture on the left-hand side where everything's a desert, and there's not much going on. They feel on their own, the middle picture, they feel on their own and um, uh, they want to do something, but they don't know how, and they don't know how to work with other people because really what they want is that picture on the right-hand side, their future uh, looks um, healthy um, and bright. And so a key element for me was, well, how are you gonna get 
children in 13 different countries from Bhutan, from India, from Malawi, from Scotland, from Germany, from Brazil, and from America, all living in mountain areas. How are we going to get a basis of communication? Because the problems are wicked problems. They're highly complex uh, and they're not easy to solve. And the sustainable development goals are one way of actually creating a common basis, not only for schools to talk, but those children to talk to their parents and to their talk to their grandparents. And also um, it's a way of us communicating across the world. So what we've developed is a, is a learning plan for all those different schools around the world um, with a focus on mountains, with a focus on water. We're using the sustainable development goals um, as uh, um, focused on, on the resources from UNESCO. So looking at global um, citizenship education, how can we become better citizens and education? So classroom based but also going out into the hills, into the mountains, into the nature and saying, we can learn about things, but what are we gonna do in, in real life? What changes? Because children, the minute you come into the classroom, they don't want all the theory. They say, but what are we gonna to do today, Julian? We wanna do something today. So it's this marriage between the theory and also action. And the other thing is in this project is making sure that, um, children in Europe understand what life is like in Bhutan, in India, in Malawi, and in, um, uh, in Peru and Colombia. So they all make an arrangement of those 17 goals. And then we have an opportunity for the children uh, to talk each other. We, like now, we have uh, Zoom opportunities where the children in these different schools with their mobile phones are able to talk to other children and with their mobile phone, stick it out of the window and say, those are the mountains, that's what I can see. What do your mountains look like? And so they can exchange their um, concerns and their fears, but also base it on um, technical, technical work around the sustainable development goals. Because what they're doing in their schools, we need to relate it to communities and to politics. So again, everyone's got their point of view from where they are, and it's exchanging those point of views to make sure everyone understands that we can work together. And as Maurizio was saying, data, collecting data is critical. So each of these schools is actually, and I was very interested, Maurizio, to hear that you've built weather stations up in the, in the mountains. It'd be very nice to follow up with you afterwards. But we've got all these schools to build weather stations so that they can actually start collecting the data and sharing the data. So that sort of gives meaning, but not only just um, technical, you know, the temperature and the wind and the amount of rainfall, but going out into the communities and saying, but let's look at the planet. What's happening to the bees in the water? What's happening to our forests in our mountains? And taking pictures like Maurizio was showing, pictures over the years of the changes. Um, and then children, <clears throat> children in, some, uh, for example, in Gunnison, Colorado, they built a walk. They built a one and a half kilometer walk, explaining the sustainable development goals, but also explaining the link to the mountains, to the headwaters and, and to their lives. And there's a, a large walk that they're building that combines the data with the sustainable development goals, but also what's happening to the, the animals and the plants and the fish and the, and, the, and the birds. And what's come out of this over the last two years is the school in Brazil have started planting trees, have started sharing um, what they've been doing with other children around the world. Children in Bhutan have built a, uh, a water um, conservation area and they've adopted a, a small stream. And so the children are saying, great, we are doing something in our school. We can share that with others, but we can learn with, um, from others. So <clears throat> the children in Brazil were fascinated about um, adopting a stream. So they've adopted a stream and the children in Bhutan said, you know, we have rhododendron bushes. We need to start looking at the rhododendron bushes. So again, the technology is enabling us um, to share, to sh exchange pictures and for, for the children to feel I'm not alone. And also we can do something as a school, but with other schools around the world. And We've got some plans for next year to scale up this. So we've got 13 schools. We're getting more and more schools um, involved as time go, times goes on. And what we're very interested in, and maybe, you know, Maurizio and others climbing guides, is, is having all that information 
and telling schools around the world, becoming climate change educators, because as exactly as Maurizio was saying, mountain guides are seeing this in their working environment. They're seeing what's happened. In a way, they're canaries in the mind that the, the mountains are showing us what is going to be happening to everyone's lives. <clears throat> but it's perhaps, as Maurizio was saying, those people were forced to move because of climate change. It's happening earlier in the mountains. And I think personally, and we're going to try and engage mountain guides, you've got a fantastic opportunity to tell that story to schools all around the world and become mountain guides, but also climate change educators. And the other thing that we're looking to do is develop a, an ebook um, that we can send out to schools, that all the schools can participate and uh, work off the same, if you like, ideas and learning plan so that what they do links in not only to the schools but to the communities and to the politics to the big decision makers because they're all using the sustainable development goals and finally obviously that's a, a picture taken in Chamonix pointing to the top of Mont Blanc we're having a call a children's call to action um, in uh, the COP26 meeting that we've got arranged um, what can children do politically to make sure to protect mountain areas from the impact of climate change? So exactly as Maurizio was saying, we need to get children politically involved and we've got a climate uh, call to action that we're presenting in, in Glasgow at COP26. We can very closely with the uh, United Nations Mountain Partnership um, to get this momentum. So it's schools in mountains, but also schools not in mountains because as Maurizio was saying, parents and children go and visit the mountains and everyone's got a role in protecting those mountains and seeing what's happening in the mountains potentially could happen to me at home wherever I am in the world. So that was the, my presentation. I'm very happy to take um, some questions and I'll hand back to, to Stefano and the moderators for yes. Next thank you, really. Thank you, Julian, for your speech and for showing us how to better link actions and theory. And uh, yes, we have some question for you, Stefano, please. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, there are actually two questions. Uh, one is a really a short answer, I guess, um, and it's there to the point. So. Uh, someone asks if you have plans uh, to extend your initiative to Nepal. And the second question, and then I will have you answer to both of them, um, asks, uh, since you have ex extensive experience on education, what is the most important thing to teach young people about climate change and resource management? As you say, Stefano, the very first, the, qu the question, the answer to the first question is yes. And if the school would like to contact me, very happy to, uh, to supply some information. In terms of um, education and um, what, what my, my takeaway is, um, climate change, what needs to be done is not rocket science. Within the first 10 minutes, children know exactly what the problem is and exactly what they need to do. They just need to be empowered by adults to do that. And that's exactly what's behind the Zero Water Day project. You don't need me as an adult telling you, a child, what to do. What you need is help to do the action, which is what's really behind the Zero Water Day project. I don't know if that answers the, the two questions there. Yes, I think it does. Ilaria? Okay. Yes, thank you, Julian, for... Uh um your speech uh, keep in touch because uh, i think that uh, we can uh, do a lot of things together and so uh for those who has just joined um, uh this series uh, julian fisher is the director of uh, zero water day partnership so you can look in for these initiatives that is really interesting and uh, we can then join uh together and uh, um yes we can keep in touch for uh, creating an international network. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we can move to the other uh, keynote speaker, keynote speaker that is uh, Rosa Laura Romeo. Uh, just two words to introduce her. Rosa Laura Romeo is program officer at the Mountain Partnership Secretariat, hosted by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, when we talked to um, Rosa Laura some days ago, we were fascinated by the initiatives carried out for women and for mountain communities overall. 
So we are happy to listen to her voice in the Youth for a Mountain series. But before I ask uh, Sarah or Giacomo to launch a video that Rosalara Rosa wants to share with us. Thank you. I wanted to collaborate with these women, bringing their heritage and know-how together with my creative skills and access to international fashion markets. Rosalara, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I as I was saying before, I have two screens and I don't know why my computer crashes. Okay, but good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy this video and I would like to start with this video uh, to tell you about some of our initiatives to support uh, the activities of mountain communities around the world. I think we are all aware that unless uh, the mountain communities have proper economic opportunities, they can have a decent livelihood in the mountains, they are sooner or later obliged to move somewhere else. Um, so uh, basically, I would like to start from this uh, collaboration we had with Stella Jean. Stella Jean is a fashion designer. She's uh, uh, from Haitian origin, but she lives in Italy. And uh, she has uh, worked with this uh, community in Kyrgyzstan uh, that uh, used these traditional techniques with felt. Felt is a material that is uh, quite popular in many different mountain areas, even in the Italian Alps, you can find a lot of manufacts with felt. But in Kyrgyzstan, they use a special techniques uh, that is using cold water and needles, and I cannot tell you more, but I've seen these uh, very beautiful products. And this technique was almost disappearing uh, because it was something that now was uh, really in the hands of some old ladies. But then some communities are now working with this again because they have realized that some tourists had some interest in this. But this collaboration has really given a new boost to this because now uh, uh, this group of women are the stars in their country. They had so many articles in the newspaper, etc. And the fact that they collaborate with uh, uh, the fashion designer that uh, was initially working for Armani, so something really relevant worldwide, put her in a completely different scheme. And allow me to tell you that uh, mm, 
Stella Jean, but also our work, were extremely careful about respecting the local culture, and there was no appropriation in any way, in the sense that the fashion designer left all the models, all the um, all the, you know, the, the, the products with the, with the ladies, and now they are selling themselves these products. So there was really uh, a win-win situation in the sense that the fashion designer learned about some very interesting techniques, and this community could really improve their work. You know, because sometimes when you buy something in a country far away, then it's a bit too ethnical when you come back. So they really learn how to shape things to reach to international market. So this was an important driver for their autonomy, for their uh, self-esteem, and also for their recognition within the country. Um, this activity is linked, is part of an initiative that we have within the Mountain Partnership. And this initiative is looking at promoting mountain products. I think we all know that mountain products have very high quality in many, many cases. So we know that mountain products are linked to the territory, to the culture, to the tradition, but also have a very specific, uh, important quality because they are often uh, produced with, uh, you know, in, uh, in organic modality. They are. Um, linked to tradition, they are different from the um, intensive cultivation in the lowland. But often these products are not able to receive a fair compensation in the market because the products are bought by middlemen and brought to the market without any uh, possibility for the buyer to identify these products. So we started long ago, I mean, quite a few years ago to start on this, to first of all enable the consumers, the buyer, to identify mountain products and uh, uh, to help them to and help the producer to reach the market uh, and obtain a fair compensation for the product. Very often, mountain products now are, are not really compensating the, the, um, the producer, the farmers, for, for the hard work that there is behind. So we work with a number of partners mainly Italian, uh, developing a, a label for these mountain products, helping the communities to uh, tell the story. So also to attach a kind of emotional content to the product, telling this is coming from this uh, culture, it's developed in this way, it's something that is linked to our uh, mountains and to our areas. And the, the results were really, really interesting. The other big issue that is that uh, um, Many, as I was saying before, many mountain products are organic, but as we all know, the certification is extremely expensive. It was absolutely impossible for most of these communities to go through the official certification process. Uh, I remember that, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan, just to stay in the same country, where they produced a very interesting, very nice apricot, um, hairless apricot, very good, very traditional, very, you know, very typical of the area. Uh, they had some German funding for a project and they could sell this product through a certification scheme. But when the project ended, it was just impossible for this community to pay every year 5,000 euro to have this certification. So basically we have promoted a, new, a different certification scheme to allow this uh, producer uh, to certify their product, but without this um, huge expense. So as I was saying, these are the these are the, um, uh, the the location of the of the countries and the communities that are working with us on this on this project. As you can say, we have uh, at the moment reached out to a bit more than ten thousand farmers, and of course, women are uh, a majority of our counterparts. And we are uh, working with twenty products in eight countries, and all the communities have um, reported a very good increase in their sales. In the, uh, in the production and also in the selling price. So altogether, this, um, this initiative has been very successful, su successful in this initial phase to reach out to communities and to improve their livelihood. Uh, and these are the products that uh, we are um, uh, you know, including in our initiative at the moment. As you can see, uh, there is uh, many different kinds of rice, teas, and also some non-food products like, uh, like the felt I was uh, referring before. 
And, and we hope to extend, we're planning to extend these uh, to, to other countries and other communities to include more products. So just a few words about the certification scheme that we are adopting that is based on uh, basically a peer review system. It's basically the communities that come together to certify their products. And it's really based on the uh, active participation of all the stakeholders and it's based on trust. And um, this is a very low cost certification and it's very suitable for, uh, for small holders, for multiple people, but it's only valid for local national markets. So it's not a certification for export. And we think that you know, national market, local market for mountain products are, uh, are, are the way to go in most cases. Of course, there are a few products that are mainly for export, but then for those um, high value products, they can only they can possibly use a, a, a different certification scheme. So the, we had the first international network of this uh, participatory uh, guarantee system, and uh, the, the participants came together, and we had in 2019 a first group established. And this is also moving forward, and this is done in a very close collaboration with uh, IFOAM, Organic International, and Natura C. Okay, so I was saying that this initiative is linked to the Mountain Partnership. Allow me to say a few words about the Mountain Partnership. The Mountain Partnership is basically the only United Nations initiative alliance existing that is uh, aiming at protecting mountain people and supporting mountain ecosystems. It was founded back in 2002 and uh, as a small group, as a small alliance with less than 40 members, it has grown a lot and includes now more than 400 members, among which 60 governments and many of, the, of your countries are possibly members of the mountain partnership because most mountain countries or, mountains with, or countries with mountains are members. And then we have a very large uh, group of civil society organizations which are really you know, leading this work and are very active. Allow me to say that this mountain partnership was uh, built, was created as a type two partnership, which in the cold uh, UN slang means that all the members are at the same level. So government, civil society organization, academic organization, very small NGOs, they're all working at the same level. So there is not top down or bottom up, whatever. All the partners are working together and they can promote initiative, they can uh, mobilize uh, members for some activities that they consider important. Uh, the secretariat that is supporting this partnership is based in the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, in FAO, where I work. And we are very grateful to um, Italy, Switzerland, and Andorra that are supporting this secretariat because without them, this work would not be possible. And uh, I think we are all here because we have uh, we share an interest for mountains and we share an interest for promoting better livelihoods for mountain people and uh, protecting the mountain environment. Uh, allow me just to share a few key data about mountains so that we are all uh, on the same page, all aware of the role the mountains have. So they cover 27% of the herd. And they host 1 billion point 100 thousand people. So a big uh, part of the world population live directly in mountain areas. And they provide to the world up to 80% of the global fresh water that we all use every day for all the activities, from agriculture, for drinking, for industrial use. So the mountains really are providing a key, a fundamental service to humanity by providing fresh water. And the mountain people, this 50% of the global population, they are the steward. They are really those that allow this mountain to continue to provide this service. So the role of mountain people in protecting the sources of water is really something that should be fully acknowledged and often it's not. Okay, then we, we know that mountains are often covered by forests. So this is another very important uh, element, especially when we talk about climate change and carbon sink. And in normal time, they are also very important for tourists. They attract globally between 15 and 20 percent of global tourists. This is an old data because this data is 2009. Uh, we are in close contact with the World Tourism Organization to try to understand if there are 
um, more recent data about tourism in mountain. And uh, it seems that there is no information available on these. So we are, um, well, we are ready to conduct the study to understand uh, the role of mountain tourism and the role it can have in supporting local um, communities, local livelihoods. The next International Mountain Day, I'm sure you're all aware, is celebrated every year on 11 of December. The next International Mountain Day will be devoted to sustainable tourism in mountain, because we think that uh, tourism can be an important driver to promote the development of mountain areas in the post-COVID um, uh, uh, situation, hopefully. Uh, I don't want to close with a, with a sad note, but uh, I need to tell you also that so we are regularly conducting studies mapping the vulnerability to food insecurity in mountain areas. The vulnerability to food insecurity is a concept explaining that people may not have food for the entire um, period of the year. So it could be that there are periods during which they don't have food. It's not a fact, it's a possibility, and it's very much linked to external driver. So we have been monitoring this vulnerability since the year 2000. And unfortunately, the vulnerability to food insecurity keeps increasing in mountain areas. So this vulnerability is on the rise. Nowadays, in mountain areas, in rural mountain areas, in developing countries, one in two mountain people is at risk of food insecurity. So one in two rural mountain people in a developing country is at risk of food insecurity. This is a very, very high number. It means that half of the rural mountain population in the world, in the developing world, is at risk. This is something that is really high. It should be a wake up call for many of us, for politicians in particular, to develop policy, to promote investment, because otherwise there's one billion, 100,000 people will possibly leave the mountain areas if they don't live there with decent uh, situation, in decent condition, uh, with human rights that are uh, similar to those that you can uh, enjoy in the lowlands. So this is, um, this is uh, just uh, you know, an overall uh, um, overview of the initiatives on mountain products that we are promoting and the mountain partnership. Uh, of course, there is much more. We also, as uh, many of you are also still students, uh, I can tell you that we also organize uh, every year um, basically two uh, summer schools. One is called IPROM and it's jointly organized with the University of Torino and two Schiller, two Italian universities. And uh, it's a two week program devoted to sustainable mountain development. It is provided in both English, usually in July, and Spanish, usually in May. And we also have a summer school on agrobiodiversity because we uh, want to support the rich mountain agrobiodiversity. And this is organized with um, the Rome University and some other international organizations. So I'll stop here. Uh, I encourage you to visit the Mountain Parish website if you want to learn more. And uh, I'm here in case you have questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Rosa Laura. And actually, there are a few questions. Um, I will um, maybe focus on just one or two because, of course, uh, we don't have the time to focus on all of them. Um, so the first question is, uh, do you think it's crucial that young people living in mountains get together to start entrepreneurial projects? And uh, the second one, which is connected to these, uh, asks how to incentivize uh, entrepreneurship in the communities and how to help them, um, the communities, to improve the business in a sustainable way. Yes, well, I, I, as I was saying at the beginning, I think if there is no economic activity in the mountain, the mountain will die. Now, in the economic opportunities are really the driver for a health, for healthy communities, unless they can have a decent life there. And then unless they can have a sustainable life, uh, sooner or later, these people are going to leave. What we see today is that in many mountain areas, um, men are migrating and women are staying there. And men send remittances, but then at a certain point, these remittances would dry up. We had this big issue during the COVID, during the pandemic. Um, 
this was due to the fact that uh, in many uh, countries there was a very strong economic crisis and all these people that had migrated there from the mountains were not able to keep providing money home. So in the many mountain areas, there were very serious economic crises due to the fact that these remittances had gone down. So I think it's really needed that uh, uh, the mountain communities are economically independent, that they can develop economic activities, that the, um, there are, I was referring to tourists before, in some cases, uh, tourists is not benefiting at all the local people. Tourists should really be embedded in the local communities and should, be, and should benefit the local communities. Yeah, I don't know if I have replied to your question. This is a very long, uh, this could be a very long conversation, but yes, local communities should be absolutely active and uh, in, in, involved in the economic activities of the countries. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. And um, maybe what we can do is also give uh, the speakers contact if uh, it's okay for everyone, we will ask um, so that people then uh, can also ask you direct questions and get in touch with you directly. Um, so Ilaria, I leave you the floor. Yes, thank you, Rosalaura. Thank you so much. Uh, so, for those who has just joined the meeting, uh, with Lo Rosa Laura Romeo of uh, Mountain Partnership, uh, we have seen uh, uh, some aspects relating to uh, mountain um, innovation and how to manage entre entrepreneurship. And now I would like to introduce Maria Mara Delgado. Uh, for uh, uh, some uh, other topics related to the interconnection. And uh, Maria Mara Delgado is the full professor at the Ayer School of Agriculture and Forestry Engineering at the University of Cordoba, Spain. And she works at the Department of Agriculture, Economics, Sociology and Policy. She had, she had a broader working experience in Europe and Latin America. And for us, she will talk about the moving project. Thank you, Maria, for being there. The floor is yours. Okay, Ilaria, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for this initiative uh, to thank for giving me the opportunity to, I would say, to learn with you, right? I think it's a great opportunity, not only to introduce a moving project, but to contribute to creating this broader partnership, especially with young people, what we think are really important for uh, rural areas and for mountain rural areas. As Ilaria has mentioned, I'm the project coordinator of a Horizon 2020 project funding by the European Commission that it's called MOVING. Moving stands for mountain valorization through interconnectedness and green growth. This is a four year project. We have just finished our first year and it gathered uh, 23 partners in um, 16 countries. It is coordinated by me at the University of Cordoba. And our main objective is to build capacities and to develop relevant policy frameworks across Europe for the establishment of value chains that might contribute to the resilience and sustainability of mountain areas, to climate change mainly, but also to other threats, uh, threats as can be the population, lack of activities and migration and so on. And as Rosa Laura has already mentioned, uh, economic activity and value chains are key assets for the future of mountain areas. Okay, so what do we aim to do first? To build capacities in mountain regions and the stakeholders in this region to enhance resilience to climate change, one of the biggest threats for these areas to identify which social and ecological factor shape the future of mountain value chain. So we extend our approach, not only to the economic aspects of value chains, but to the social and ecological factors behind these value chains. And we will produce scenarios 
by 2050 to know how this can evolve. We also, uh, the call we, we applied for uh, was in a call, in a broader call that aiming, that was aiming to uh, support uh, policymakers, uh, European Commission, with a sound evidence base for what they call the creation of a new generation of policies for rural areas. So it's quite important our role in uh, providing these evidences that will not be only a scientific evidences, but also a local or stakeholders based evidences. And as mentioned, we want to enhance the resilience and the sustainability of this region through new or upgraded value chains. But for us, it's very, very important what we call the multi-actor approach. That is to setting up to creating a European community of stakeholders that might foster the change of knowledge and experiences. We need to do this with the broader possible support with a bottom-up approach and engaging as much people as possible in order to uh, provide uh, relevant uh, outcomes for, for the future and also a legacy that is not yet, that is a four years research project, but after we aim to, to create this community of practice that we will talk about and to, and that will be the, the legacy of the project. Uh, we have a quite, uh, I would say, extensive approach. We, oh, sorry. We, we aim to, to develop several products. First of all, an inventory of value chains uh, with a social ecological system approach to highlight the diversity of value chains. Then we will uh, analyze the value chains in 23 bound and case studies where we will work much more in depth. We also aim to do a cross k comparison in order to understand what are, what are the potential of these value chains and how can they be valorized, not only in the, in the local level, in the, in the mountain areas, but also in, in close, close interaction with other mountain regions and looking forward cross fertilization comparisons and so on. And as I said, we will also develop a participatory multi-level foresight analysis with a scenario of 2050, where we aim to highlight the future perspectives and also how these most desired scenarios can be make a reality by the stakeholders. With this, we will develop a, a policy audit and. Uh, a new and updated proposal for policies. Um, we, pro we will develop the, the uh, policy roadmap. Two important things in this uh, work is, on the one hand, the youth engagement. We really need the young people and we want to understand what are their motivations and what are their constraints to stay in, in mountain areas. And we also aim to develop this, the community of practice that I've already mentioned. So that is a great opportunity to get in touch with youngsters for all over the world and to attract their attention to our project. And we hope that from now on, new opportunities of collaboration will develop. We are working, as I've mentioned, in 23 mountain regions in, in Europe, in 16 uh, European and neighboring countries. And in all of them, we will analyze the value chains. And at this, how do we understand our community of practice? In each of these regions, we will establish what we call a, a regional multi-actor pl platform where all the stakeholders that have something to do with both the mountain region and the value chains existing there uh, can work together and can uh, propose uh, initiatives or uh, share knowledge, uh, propose new actions, uh, constraints, opportunities, and so on. 
all these regional maps will be uh, connected through what we call EU multi-actor platform, where they will be not only the local uh, partners, but also partners at higher level, a European or a global level that are also interested in mountain areas and are not part of our project. So all these people will be uh, connected through this EU multi-actor platform where several activities were, will be developed, uh, mainly those of uh, like validating our results or supporting our results with uh, their insights. But we can also invite this uh, uh, community of practice, other external actors, whoever is interested in mountain regions and is uh, looking for uh, their future sustainable and resilient future, is very welcome to participate in our project, to propose whatever they want, to validate our results, to collaborate with us and so on. And as I said, we would be very, very happy to engage young people. So we, we, our community of practice can be like several rings. We have a care group where that is the people already involved in the project, but we also invite other active participants that uh, can help us in the co-creation of validation of our key research outputs and results and to exchange knowledge and experiences but whoever is interested in working with us in, on a more occasional uh, mood or even peripheral participants or even transactional participants, as I said, our community of practice is absolutely open to whoever wants to participate. Um, uh, they can do on the basis of their preferences. So as you can see, there are many rings for uh, participation. I'm aiming to have a long lasting community that goes beyond the project. We are developing some tools. As I said, we are in the first year of the project and has been a very, very complicated uh, year because of COVID-19 and because of the different delays and problems we, we have to, to face. But we hope that from now on, we can speed the, our, our, the processes and to provide uh, more results soon. So we are we we plan to create a mountain a moving up mountains up where the young people are very very important for us. The idea will be to uh, design with a youngster a tool to foster the engagement of people. Uh, both citizens and visitors to the resilience of the mountain regions. And then I heard about Julian uh, up. I would like to know a bit more. Probably I will, I will contact him to know how do they do and how can we do something or how can we share uh, knowledge or, uh, or join forces. We also uh, will do an open tool for the visualization of georeferenced data. For a moment, we have a lot of maps of what is the situation in, Manta, in, the, in the regions we work, uh, both, uh, let's say, climate change, land abandonment, and the population. So we have uh, a number of maps already uh, created. And the idea now is to create this tool that uh, will be open to whoever is interested to work with and will give us uh, good information about what is going on. That is, I would say, sec uh, secondary information. Now we are creating primary information, working with the stakeholders about the vulnerability analysis of these value chains that will be also mapped and will be uh, at, the, at the disposal of whoever is interested. And finally, we will develop a policy toolkit to support future policy formulation, but that will only be in the last year of the project. Okay, so there's a good number of outputs that uh, we aim to, to produce, and that uh, I can give you that. You can see this presentation, but you can also see our website, follow our web our uh, social network and then you will be in touch about what are the developments of this project so thank you very much um we thanks are a lot
Thanks a lot. And um, as I said earlier, uh, we will send all the participants uh, your contacts if you um, if they want to ask you direct questions. Uh, I will ask you just a quick question uh, that was put on the mirror board by the participants, uh, which ask uh, why involvement and connections with the local level is crucial for mountain development. Is it just for knowledge exchange or uh, also about other things? No, they, they, they are key, they are essential partners. If we look at our mountain regions, uh, they look wonderful, beautiful, but if people disappear from there, it will be a lot of uh, threats. So we, we cannot guarantee the sustainability or the resilience of these areas without people. And we have a lot of examples, for instance, fire, wildfire uh, are more and more an issue in mountain regions. And part of this is, of course, because climate change, because there are less uh, rainwater and there's a more persistent drought all over the world. But at the same time, because the traditional management of mountains or mountain forests is not done anymore with uh, animal, with shepherds, with uh, people uh, working and, and maintaining this area. So people is absolutely essential for mountain areas. Thank you, Maria Mar Delgado. Thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, we will keep in touch uh, because yes, um, this moving project can help us also to find a, a new solution to, to real problem as we are looking for this. And uh, uh, now I move to uh, the last but not least uh, speaker, that is Valeria Leoni. Uh, I know that we are a little bit later, but uh, if you can uh, stay connected, uh, we will close this meeting. Otherwise, you will receive uh, all the information um, uh, also by email for, for participants. So Valeria, Valeria Leoni is a research fellow at Unimont, the University of Mountain uh, that is part of the University of Milan. Valeria has been working on, on agrobiodiversity uh, in three different national projects with considerable, considerable production of scientific knowledge on this topic. And she has also graduated in agroecosystem management at the University of Pisa. She has an extensive knowledge in agro-system sustainable management due to her international experience in integrated pest management, and she is winner of Queensland Prime Super Agricultural Innovation Award in 2018. So, Valeria, thank you. The floor is yours. Okay. Can, can you see the presentation? Yes. Good. So today we are talking about agrobiodiversity that is central to the overall biodiversity. In general, mountains are hotspots of biodiversity and also uh, of agrobiodiversity, as we will see further. Agrobiodiversity includes the diversity of plant, animal, fish, trees, and microbes that are used directly or indirectly for food and agriculture. So the link with the human activity of agriculture is very uh, is fundamental. And uh, following uh, the definition of uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, agrobiodiversity is the foundation of sustainable uh, agricultural development. So we were talking before about the importance of a sustainable development. So uh, going on with the uh, convention on, uh, of uh, biological diversity definition, we can define different levels of uh, agrobiodiversity. Agrobiodiversity are the components of uh, biodiversity supporting the agroecosystems. We can make very easy to understand examples as pollinators and biological agents that, as Ilaria said before, is one of my uh, topic of work. Then we have also the abiotic factors that are, for example, climate and soil that generate diversity among agroecosystems. As we said before, the human activity of agriculture is fundamental in uh, agrobiodiversity. So we have also uh, the socioeconomic and cultural dimension. 
We can think about, for example, ecotourism that was mentioned before, and is the tourism, tourism associated with agricultural landscape. But we, we have also the traditional knowledge how to preserve and grow uh, ancient varieties and breeds. And finally, we have also uh, the genetic resources for food and agriculture, including plants, animal trees, fish and microbes, but also uh, the wild uh, managed uh, resources and the wild relatives of domestic, domesticated species. So um, thinking about uh, these uh, uh, levels, we can define also levels of genetic diversity uh, from bigger to smaller. We can, uh, we can explain like this. So we have a difference uh, um, uh, among the agroecosystem that is uh, um, the, the, biggest, uh, um, the, the biggest case. Then we have uh, uh, differences uh, um, between uh, species, so in interspecific diversity and within species. So the intraspecific diversity that maybe is the easiest to understand because it's the difference uh, uh, among uh, uh, plant cultivars and uh, animal breeds. So in fact, the intraspecific diversity can, be, can include the wild relatives, uh, modern cultivars, uh, access to collections, so the gene banks, uh, and finally, uh, finally land races. So what are uh, these land races? Uh, land races are defined as dynamic population, populations of cultivated plants, uh, that have a, a, spe a specific identity and an historical origin. So it's very important that they have a, a history linked to their territory. They lack formal crop improvements, so they are very rich in their uh, genetic patrimony. They, are, they have a very rich genetic pool, and we will understand after how, how this is important. So uh, land races, the name, land plus races highlights the important link of uh, these ancient uh, breeds and varieties. We, we are talking land, land races specifically of plant varieties, uh, the, the important links with the territory. In fact, they are biomolecule transform local resources, they're rustic, they're adaptive, so they're suitable to, to organic and low, low input agriculture. This is really important in the case of uh, uh, fragile and marginal territories as mountain areas. In fact, the difference with the modern varieties uh, is that these last are not suitable to a low input uh, agricultural model because they were uh, intensively uh, selected uh, through conventional breeding and biotechnologies. And so uh, the paradox is that modern breeds and varieties, although uh, usually used worldwide, they have a low genetic vari variabilities uh, compared, uh, comparing uh, to uh, ancient varieties that maybe are rare, uh, they are uh, in a small number, but they have uh, a higher genetic variability. Modern breeds and variety, uh, varieties are suitable to intensive production, monocultures, and uh, high external synthetic inputs, uh, such as fertilizer and pesticide, but also water, we were talking about uh, the problem of water lack uh, just before. So uh, agricultural intensification and the use of modern breeds and varieties is one of uh, the reasons of the loss of agrobiodiversity together with the habitat loss, market globalization, and climate change. And according to Food and Agriculture Organization, in the last decades, we lost uh, more than 17% of uh, our heritage of uh, agrobiodiversity. So uh, while we have uh, uh, the improved varieties, the modern varieties uh, that played a key role in the Green Revolution to fight hunger and provide wellness in particular to the developed countries, we have also species that continue, uh, the traditional varieties that continue be, to be important in particular in developing countries. And uh, we have uh, uh, this coexistence of modern and traditional types, uh, luckily. For example, Italy is particularly rich in agrobiodiversity. We did a study recently, just last year, uh, surveying uh, the total number of agrobiodiversity in Italy, focusing on herbaceous land races. That means horticultural land races, not trees. 
because this last uh, is particularly at the risk of being lost, uh, being cultivated by the ho mostly hobby farmers. And uh, we could find that, uh, as I said, Italy is very rich in agrobiodiversity, and in particular, hilly and some mountain areas are hot hotspots for horticultural agrobiodiversity. Um, so uh, the uh, most fam numerous family were Fabace, Poace, and Salonace, that uh, concentrated in the mountain areas uh, between 150 and 800 meters above sea level. So these families uh, contain uh, varieties that are uh, very used in the mountains, for example, beans or uh, potatoes or rye and other cereals. So uh, we can draw parallel between the Italian situation and in the hilly some mountain and in general marginal areas. So not only mountains, uh, but also small islands and archipelagos are hotspots of biodiversity and agrobiodiversity. So we need uh, to focus on these uh, uh, marginal areas to protect and promote this heritage. And inventories, so the chances of these uh, of agrobiodiversity is just a first step uh, towards the study, conservation, and promotion of agrobiodiversity. So we can, we can explain this with a very simple uh, example that is, a study, that is a study we did recently on a specific land race that was uh, Nero Spinoso. We found a Nero Spinoso cultivated by just one farm in, in 100 meter square field. And we, study, uh, we studied this uh, ancient variety, the finding that is particularly healthy because it's rich in bioflavonoids that are flobafin that accumulates in the pericarp. So this, uh, this corn variety is a dark and beaked variety. And uh, the last uh, step was the stakeholder involvement. So in collaboration with the municipality of Esin and Pianconio that are in Valle Camonica, Nero Spinoza was included in the list of a variety of conservation. And today it's not out of risk, but it's cultivated by seven farmers in 30,000 meters square. So uh, if you are young people who want to work and preserve agrobiodiversity, I have maybe some uh, advices uh, for you. So firstly, you have to understand the basic concepts, and then you have to apply this kind of generic concepts to the mountain local context. And uh, of course, appreciate, as I said before, uh, the perspective of multiple uh, stakeholders. And then uh, planning for action to reduce the loss of mountain agrobiodiversity. Of course, you have to consider biodiversity in general. So uh, to, to preserve biodiversity together with agrobiodiversity, you have uh, to uh, understand uh, the concept of sustainable exploitation of biodiversity resources find a balance between agricultural forestry and wild biodiversity conservation, and then define uh, a, a sustainable trade-off between biodiversity conservation and economic development, including the, protect the protection of biosphere reserves and regional parks. I want to say you goodbye with just an example that is from our valley. So where Unimonte is situated, that is Valle Camonica, is in a valley in the middle of the Italian Alps. Uh, and it's an example of a young entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur that built its activity on uh, some land races that we recently studied. Studied one is the Nero Spinoza we were talking about before, and the other is a Copa Farm. Just an example to explain uh, that uh, agrobiodiversity is not just to preserve, but uh, it is a chance to create sustainable value chains uh, in the mountains. And also it was a really good, uh, <laughs> a really, a really good chance also the, uh, the quality label said before by Mountain Partnership, for example, that was really interesting for what uh, I'm working on. Thank you for your, <laughs> for your time. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you for presenting us uh, your uh, studies that could be applied also in other regions, as you said before. And um, now we are at the end of our seminar. We know that there are some questions for you, but we will send you and then we will share with all participants uh, yeah, your answers. So um, now I will share uh, my presentation just to give you 
uh, the next steps. Uh, but before, if you agree, we can, you can turn on your camera and smile just to uh, have a peek of this uh, event. Um, so let's take uh, just uh, some uh, some seconds to to have this peek. Giacomo or Stefano, tell me where we are ready, and uh, then I can move to the to the final presentation just uh, for the next steps. We have to smile also. Okay, that's fine. Okay, then. perfect. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next steps. Um, we are in the part of creating this uh, uh, mountain education and innovation manifesto. So um, uh, we would like to uh, create this manifesto that include uh, uh, your idea and your opinions uh, on how uh, we can manage uh, in a good way mountains area in order to live in a sustainable uh, way. Uh, so th this is our main goal. And to reach this goal, the next steps are Please answer to the topics question on Miro and share your project, your ideas in this dashboard. You can easily um, write uh, your, your opinions and on the basis of what uh, you will write, we can create a first draft of the manifesto. And then I remind you the second event of the next uh, September 22nd, uh, in which uh, uh, divided in working tables, we, we, we will share ideas uh, on the basis of, with, um, of, of what we have collected on the Miro dashboard. So uh, thank you, uh, really thank you for being here. You will receive an email if you uh, want to ask friends to join uh, um, this, uh, the next event. Uh, it's fine for us. Uh, so uh, we will see. Uh, we will see in the next uh, in the next event. And thank you so much for being there. Bye. 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 Thank you.